Hi there, it's Gabrielle Nicolet from Speech Kids, where we teach little kids to talk and help parents understand their little kids. And today we are talking to Robin Brannon. Hi, Robin. Hi. Robin Brannon, you know what? I'm going to let you introduce yourself and where you are and what you do. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So by training and by profession, I'm a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist. My practice is Better Together Family Therapy. We are a group practice located in Kensington, and we treat kids ages four and up and their families, always involving the family piece, always involving the relationship piece. Um, we tend to specialize in kids that have ADHD, anxiety, autism, and all sorts of related conditions that come along with that. So certainly we see a lot of kids with speech concerns as well. Yep. And so you're often, I'm sure, co-treating with, with speech pathologists. Absolutely. That's how we meet lovely people like you. I know. And it's so much fun. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about emotional regulation, and we are definitely going to define what that is. So please tell us, what is emotional regulation and why do we need it? That's a really good question. Emotional regulation is one of those things that we don't ever think about, right? Until we are feeling dysregulated or we're feeling out of control. So emotional regulation is really the act of being able to bring ourselves emotionally to where we need to be in a given moment. Mm -hmm. Most of the time that means being able to bring ourselves back to a sense of calm or being at peace, feeling okay internally. But some of the time it also means upregulating ourselves, um, getting our energy back for something that really requires our energy. You know, we do that as adults with our cup of coffee in the morning. Sometimes we upregulate. Of tea in the afternoon. It's more often need the down regulation than the up regulation, but certainly with online school, they've needed to upregulate a little bit to get their attention in place for that as well. I often say feeling regulated means feeling good in your own skin. Yes. Right. And that sometimes resonates because, and, and, and the flip side of that is we have, we both see kids who don't often feel good in their own skins. Mm -hmm. And so for whatever reason, be it a sensory processing disorder that goes along with your autism or be it your anxiety where you've got the chatter going on all the time, mm -hmm. that is a state of dysregulation. And so it's, it's that feeling of like the other shoe is going to drop, like, uh, something's yeah. not quite right. Mm -hmm. um, and what I it often explain, exhausting. it's exhausting. It's and, exhausting for parents and for kids. Yeah. And you can't learn in that state. That's so true. That's the other piece of it, right? When we're, and we're going to get into the meat and, and, and potatoes of it, but like emotional regulation is a really important precursor to learning, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, there are some therapists that use biofeedback devices in couple and family sessions, especially to see when somebody gets dysregulated enough that they're not taking information in anymore so that they can stop the session, downregulate, and then go back to the work because you lose the opportunity to grow in that moment. You're just not open to new things. I have goosebumps because that's leveraging what we know about neurobiology mm -hmm. with the psychological piece of it. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's cool. <laughs> I could geek out about that all day long. Okay, but let's talk about emotional regulation. So yeah. walk us through, you, you mentioned this before we started recording, which is when baby comes home from the hospital, mm -hmm. we automatically, some more than others, but, <laughs> but we figure out how to co-regulate, how to walk us through. Yes, absolutely. So even, even if we don't feel like we're figuring anything out, we have to follow our instincts when we first bring a baby home. We can't have a conversation with that child and find out what that child thinks they need in that moment. We can't use our verbal skills. We have to use the other things that we have. We have to use our tone of voice. We use our breath. We use our heart rate. We use motion right? We sway with the baby, we move with the baby, you know, as parents, even when our babies are grown, we still find ourselves like not able to stand still. I still do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Once you do it, you do it forever. <laughs> um, but we have those skills innate within us and we don't even notice that we're using them. It's just what we try when we have a baby that we need to soothe. 
we tend to drop those skills when our kids get verbal. We tend to stop trying them or stop using them. And the really cool thing about it is they're still in there and they still work. Mm. So when you have a preschooler who's melting down and in that moment, just like they can't learn, they can't articulate either, right? Even if they have the words, and we work with so many kids that don't have the words, but even if they have the words, they don't have the words in that moment when they're flooded with emotion, they're dysregulated in that moment. And so we need our nervous systems to soothe their nervous systems. We need to settle ourselves in order to settle them. And just being in contact with them, holding their hand, sitting beside them, having a gentle hand on their shoulder or on their back while we're breathing slowly, while we're calming our own nervous systems is the best tool in our toolbox in that moment. This is so interesting because, and, and you sort of alluded to this, right? Babe, when baby grows into toddler slash preschooler, and there's this gray area for at least a year, probably 18 months where like, we don't know, is it a baby? Is it a toddler? I don't know. It's just kind of crazy. Um, but once, chi- once kids get to be about three and they're very verbal, usually at age three, mm-hmm. certainly my clients are having a little bit more difficulty than that, but the average three-year-old can have a great conversation about what they did and tell you about their life and their family and all the things, except if they're dysregulated and and they don't have access to all of that. But because as parents of, of that age child of a preschooler, because they're so verbal most of the time, Mm -hmm. we've, we've switched as parents, haven't we, between sort of using those more physical, more um, tactile based sort of well, um, what do I want to say sensory. about that? Say it again. Using sensory. Using sensory, sensory means of regulating. And we try to talk. <laughs> we try. <laughs> um, and we use a lot of talking about, well, it's not that big of a deal. You're, the boo-boo that you got falling <laughs> on the sidewalk is, it's, look, it's not so big. It's okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. Meanwhile, child is having a total meltdown. And really what they need is to be scooped up and just yeah. held. Yes. Scooped up and held by someone who can stay calm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's really our hardest job as parents in that moment when our anxiety is up because that boo-boo is bleeding or (laughs) we need to be somewhere and we don't have the time to stop and downregulate in that moment. I promise you it's always more efficient to stop and downregulate and then keep moving. Say that again. Say that that again. (laughs) It is always more efficient to stop what you're doing and downregulate. It doesn't take as long as you think it does. Um, When you really meet your child's nervous system with your nervous system in that way, and you settle each other, then you're able to move forward so much more efficiently from there that you really don't lose any time. I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to, I'm going to look directly into the camera and I'm going to say it again, (laughs) because if you're watching this, honestly, it takes so much less time to slow down. It does. And get regulated. And even I could feel, you know, we're feeding off of each other here, right? We're, and we're both pretty high energy people. Did you feel the energy sort of amp up just now? Yes. As we were talking. And I don't know if you noticed, viewer, <laughs> what I just did. Took it down a notch. Mm-hmm. It, it took two seconds. Yeah. Literally, it took two seconds. Um, yeah. But it's a skill, right? And it's, it's a skill that we do need to practice as parents, you know, don't be hard on yourself if you don't already know how to do this instinctively, because it is something that we sort of forget how to do as our kids grow and they're in the verbal world with us. It just takes some time and some energy to get back in touch with that piece of ourselves, that side of ourselves, and just to be able to put up the stop sign for yourself in the moment when you feel yourself getting keyed up, right? Your shoulders come up, you feel that little bit of tension, you hear it in your voice, your child hears it in your voice. Come on, we gotta go, put your shoes on. Like that voice comes out of you, you know that you need to slow down. You need to take a really good deep breath. You need to find the thing that makes you feel at peace and calm and whole. 
there are a couple of ways that we can do that. Oh, really good. I was going to ask you about that just now. <laughs> really good deep breathing is number one on everybody's list. And the reason it's number one is that it does some really great physiological things for us. It slows our heart rate down. And we can't really do that another way. We can't do that <laughs> willfully. And so the deep breathing really helps with that. I like to teach parents and kids something called 4-7-10 breathing. Mm which is where you breathe in deeply for four counts, really good belly breath. So feeling the air go in and all the way down to the bottom of the lungs behind the belly button so that your belly puffs out a little bit, not held in like we're used to as moms, but puffed out a little bit. <laughs> Show that belly when you're doing a good deep breath. So you breathe in for four and then you hold for seven. and blow out for 10. <laughs> that was hard for me. <laughs> it is hard. It's a lot longer than you would naturally breathe out and you wouldn't normally take that pause. Mm -hmm. But that pause of seven in the middle is what really slows you down. It really slows you down. And if you're taking a really good deep breath with that four count, then you do have enough air to slowly breathe out for 10. If you didn't have enough air to slowly breathe out for 10, it just takes practice. Being able to take in enough air in that four count to breathe out for 10. But when I'm talking to little kids about this, I like to talk about it as the secret code that unlocks our calm, right? Ooh, I love <laughs> so, that. You know, Kids have seen codes tapped out on a keypad. Mm -hmm. We don't think they have, but they have. They see you unlock your phone. They see you put your pin in at the ATM. <laughs> they see the code happen. So 4710 is the secret code. This is how we unlock our calm. And we can do that at bedtime when we need to really settle ourselves out. Or we can just do that in a moment where we're naturally a little more keyed up and a little more anxious. When you're dropping your preschooler off at school in the morning and there's that impending separation, there's that sense of, is this going to go okay? Is kid going to cry? Am I going to cry? <laughs> What's going to happen in this, in this drop off moment? That can be a really hard moment. And just taking time to kind of put in the secret code before you get out of the car or before you walk in the door of the school can be really, really helpful. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more likely your child is to do it naturally without even thinking about it. This is amazing. And uh, yeah, and particularly when we're putting this in at age three or four, and they've got a lifetime to just kind of internalize this good habit in the same way that we internalize other habits <laughs> right? Um, that maybe aren't so helpful. I'm also thinking, you know, we're recording this in April of 2021. So it, this is the pandemic is kind of still in session, but ending. So people are going back to in-person. There are some kids who haven't, they don't have any recollection of having been in group care or having left their immediate family or been with anybody other than their family for quite some time. And so that's an area where there's a lot of potential for dysregulation, even from a very typically developing child. Right. Um, and I think it remains to be seen what we're gonna see in terms of <laughs> <laughs> the consequences of a year of isolation, but that's a different story. Um, you know what, though? We have the resources within us to move through that and to come into the greatest possible version of ourselves from having experienced that challenge. So I'm confident that we'll be good. I love it. We're going to, yeah. there's so much more we could talk about. We're going to leave it there. I love the 4710. Thank you for sharing that. Oh my gosh, um, absolutely. And it, just a couple of little points about the 4710 breathing. If you have a child that is not willing to try something with you when they're dysregulated, when they're melting down, when they're upset, introduce it someplace else. Yeah. Do a 4710 breath before you eat dinner yeah. or do it some other time during the day so that it's a skill that's introduced. And you can just kind of casually mention, remember the secret code when your child is upset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where can people find out more about you? 
Oh, that is a great question. Um, our website is betterfamilytherapy.com and we blog there a minimum of once per week, sometimes more than that. There's also a little pop-up when you go to the website for the first time that you can sign up for our newsletter. And that monthly newsletter will let you know what's been on the blog for the month. So if you don't want to navigate back to the blog, we also have a professional Facebook page for Better Together Family Therapy. We're on Twitter as Better Together Family Therapy. We're on LinkedIn as Better Together Family Therapy. Those are all the places that you can see those blog posts come up. Perfect. And then if you just want to know more about our practice, absolutely, the website at betterfamilytherapy.com. Fantastic. We will also have a link uh, to the website with this video. Um, and I'm hoping we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. There is right. there's so much more. There's so much more. I know. <laughs> so much more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. Of course.